Lord Sykes Sr. And uh, we know that the Lord gives, the Lord takes, but blessed be the name of the Lord. Family, we're praying for you, especially at a grievous time like this, not only dealing with the aches and the pains and the suffering that comes from this time of quarantine and uh, seeing suffering all over the world, but also uh, it's now touched close to home uh, with the loss of our brother. But we recognize the fact that we've been endures for the night. But we're thankful the scripture tells us that joy comes in the morning. At this time, we're going to open and we're going to prepare with uh, an opening selection by our brother, uh, Mr. William Ray, this time. Just a closer walk with me. Isaiah, the major prophet, chapter 55, and we'll be looking at verses 8 through 11. The word says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. For as a man cometh down in the snow from heaven uh, and returneth, know thither, but watereth the earth and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that way, that it will bring forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. We're also going to be moving toward the New Testament as well, where we find another blessed text in the book of 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, and we're going to be looking explicitly at verses 1 through 9. 
For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle shall dissolve, we have another building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of his spirit. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that whether absent or present, we may be accepted of him. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading, the hearing, but most importantly, the receiving of his most holy word. Thanks be to God. Let us pray, my brothers and sisters. Father, you, we come to you as humble as we know how, recognizing in you we live, in you we move, and in you we have our being. Father, we don't know what tomorrow may bring, we don't even know what today holds. But Father, we know who holds the future. And we want to say thank you. We want to say thank you because the word tells us in everything we ought to give thanks. For this is the will of God concerning us. We thank you for our uprising. We thank you for our downlaying. Father, we thank you that we were able to rise another day in your glorious land. Father, we bring to you the pain of our hearts as we now seek comfort and celebration for our brother and our friend, George. Father, you knew his heart, you knew his ways, and we thank you for being his God. Father, we thank you for the time that we were able to spend in his presence and the time he was able to spend in ours. But now, Father, that time has passed. And we recognize the fact that as we stand here asking the existential question today, our brother has left us and now we're struggling trying to figure out how we're going to be able to go on. But Father, we thank you that we are not those who cry and weep as those who have no hope because we recognize that we do not live to die, but we thank you that we live to live again. So, Father, we ask that you receive our brother George into your hand and into your spirit. But while we are yet here, help us to remember that one day they will gather for us. One day we will be viewed and not seen. One day our bed sheets will become our winding sheets. One day we're going to give up the ghost. Father, help us to have joy in recognizing the fact that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So while we weep in the flesh, we celebrate in the spirit as our brother has gone on before us to be a forerunner of those things to come. And so, Father, we will cherish the memories and allow that to bring us comfort. And if our memories are not enough to bring us the comfort and joy in our spirits, we ask, Lord, that you would be our strength. For the word of God says that your strength is made perfect in our weakness. So we thank you, Lord, for transforming us into the image of your son, Jesus. We thank you for the work that you're doing in our lives. And we just ask, Lord, that you don't quit. Don't leave us now. We've come too far for you to forsake us now. And we thank you that you've been faithful to carry us all the way. We ask that you would comfort this family, that you would lead them, that you would guide them, that you would strengthen them in the days to come. And if you'll do these things for us, we'll be careful to continue to praise and celebrate your name. Because truly, even in the midst of this crisis, 
We know that you're good. We know that you're God. And we know that you're worthy of our praise. It's in Jesus' name that we pray together as a body of faith. Amen and amen. Brothers and sisters, at this time, I want to share with you before we look at our obituary, I have three cards uh, that have been given to comfort the family. The first says, a message, a message sent in sympathy, and though the words are few, still may they help to ease the loss of one so dear to you. And that comes to us from Sister Zula Ann. Praying you'll be comforted with precious memories and God's presence to care for you in your loss with sympathy. The text down below says, may our prayer continue to be with you and your family during this time. Love always the Bird and Harris families. And then there's a card from Perry Brown Funeral Service that says, thank you for allowing the staff at Perry J. Brown Funeral Service to assist your family during a difficult time of need. And that's presented by Brother Charles Cooper, owner and director. Let's turn our attention to the obituary for a silent reading. And then Brother Ray will bless us with another selection.
Our second Corinthians text says, For we know that our earthly house of this tabernacle shall be dissolved, but we have a building of God, a house not made by hands, eternal in the heavenly. Brothers and sisters, a house is one of the most prized possessions that we can own. In our nation, we understand that the first step to achieving the American dream is home ownership. In these volatile economic times, one of the telltale signs that things are getting better or worse is the evidence of home ownership. It is difficult for us to imagine that so many have worked all of their lives, and there's some who have even lost their homes. If you've ever talked to someone who's lost their home, they usually don't talk about the brick and the mortar. They usually don't mention the size of the windows or the acreage of the backyard. Most people, when they lose their home, they talk about the memories and the experiences that they had in the home. This is where I raised my family. My husband and I planted this rose garden together. You can imagine a real nice house, but a house truly is not a home until some memories have been made there. What makes a house of home is that the people that live inside share their most valuable, most insightful moments. The family atmosphere is what makes it a home. The closeness that people feel toward one another is what makes it a warm place where you can go and be comfortable. You see, a house is a house. It was Luther said, but it's not a home. If there's no one that is waiting there for us, what's the difference? A home is where somebody puts up with you. <laughs> uh, a house is just a shell, a showplace, a facade. But a home, as the poet Robert Frost shared, is where when you go there, they have to take you in. A house is not a home. Here, the poet who says it takes a heap of living to turn a house into a home. You see, most of us are about the business of trying to build an earthly home. Some, some folks try to build the home in their physique. They want to strengthen this outward facade that we have. But the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost who lives in you, whom ye have received of God, who is not your own? You are not your own. You've been bought with a price. Therefore, we're building it as we think for ourselves, but yet we must be building for God's sake, why? Because he is the ultimate owner. There's some folk who try to build their own reputations. They get busy trying to build their own legacy. We're very careful about the images that we portray. We want other people to think well of us and to think that we're doing well even when we're not. We'll spend money to try to keep up with the Joneses so that we can look like we got it going on, but Really, when we look at the bank accounts, really when we look into the mirror, when we look at each other, we have already recognized the fact that maybe it's not all that it's cracked up to be. We want to be esteemed by our community. We want to be respected by our families. We want to be regarded by our neighbors. We want to build a reputation, but we recognize the fact the song tells us that time is filled with swift, transitions. By the time we try to invest in ourselves, by the time we try to solidify our reputation, time has moved on. And then there are those of us who try to build our own futures. James 4, 13 through 17 says, come now, uh, you say today 
or tomorrow. Let's go into the city. Let's spend a year there. Let's trade and get gain. Whereas you don't know what your life will be like tomorrow. But what is your life? You are a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. James says what we ought to say is if it be the Lord's will, we will then live and do this or that. We glory in our own boasting at times, but he tells us all of our boasting, all of our trying to get reputation, all of our trying to build ourselves, all of us trying to secure our own future is for naught. To him, therefore, who knows to do good and does not do good for him, it is sin. What we recognize, brothers and sisters, in this text is that God is the one who owns the building. Why? Because God owns the blueprints. The Bible says that he has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pastures. I would presume that Brother George had time to process the fact that he was dealing with the fact that he had a tent that kept on leaning. A house that, as much as he tried to build it up, somehow life and the affairs of this world began to tear it down. But this text allows us to know that we can joy and have glory in the fact that God is the one who owns the building. This is just temporary. This body that we have before us, Brother George, as we knew him, we interacted, we interfaced with him, he laughed, he 